and welcome this morning to BFA. We are so glad you joined us. Why don't you stand with us as we uh, open in prayer, and then we're going to sing a couple Christmas carols. Everybody ready for that this morning to get us going in this Christmas season? God, thank you for your presence already in this place as we watch that video. Wow, Jesus, the reason for this season, Lord. We want to come to your throne of grace this morning to worship you, to honor you. Help us, God, to do that in spirit and truth. We love you. In Jesus' name, oh, come, let us adore you. Oh, come, let us adore you. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. For you Bye. 
offer him this morning. We offer you our lives, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being my joy. Thank you, Lord. And thank you, Jesus. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Let's give him praise this morning. Hallelujah. And thank you, Father. Thank you. Lord. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Oh, come all you faithful. Oh, come all ye faithful. this Christmas season, Lord. It's all about your birth. You had to come as a baby before 
You can give your life for us, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father. We adore you this morning. I give you all the praise and glory. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. How many appreciate the worship band? Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. I love Christmas carols, so they did a fantastic job. Especially the little drummer boy, that rock. That was very cool. Just want to share a few announcements with you as you came in this morning. You probably saw one of the Christmas trees, our giving trees. And usually we take a card off there for a boy or a girl a certain age and buy a gift for them. But due to COVID, everything due to COVID, we are actually giving out gift cards to two organizations, Koinonia Foster Care and Pathway Foster Care as well. So if you just take one of those cards off the tree and get a gift card for $20 at Walmart or Target and then bring them back next week, there's going to be a box you can drop those off. Let me know it's important to take care of orphans, widows and orphans, yes. the Bible says. And this is a great time in Christmas. You know your gift is going to a great ministry so we appreciate your support on that also we're coming up on the end of the year and in january we send out giving statements for tax purposes we just want to make sure we have your right address and so if you've moved this year or if you may think the church uh, doesn't have your correct address please let us know contact the church office so we can make sure that's taken care of we do have our regular prayer service tonight in person and online at 5 30 you're free to join us here or join us in prayer online also, midweek Bible study this Wednesday is online only because it, it takes a lot of volunteers to put a service together like this with all the COVID precautions that we take. So hopefully in January, we'll be able to add that to our on, uh, in-person service as well on Wednesday nights. On Sunday mornings, right now at 11 o'clock, we have our youth meeting over in the youth room, and they also do a watch party on Wednesday nights at 6.30. If you have a young person in your family or in your neighborhood, get them, get them connected with our youth as well. Our youth staff's doing a fantastic job. And so we're, we're grateful for all that God is doing in this season. We appreciate you so much. And now Brock, one of our board members, has a special announcement. Well, this morning before our first service, we had a beautiful white Christmas out here. <laughs> Only it wasn't uh, a blanket of snow, it was, it was a blanket of fog. I guess that's our version of having a white Christmas here in, in Bakersfield. Yeah. Well, good morning. I'm Brock Metters, and I serve on the board of directors here. I just wanted to remind you all that uh, this, we're taking up our Christmas love offering for our pastors. And when you walked in the doors this morning, you may have noticed the the pink envelopes at the tables, those are the, the envelopes that you can use. Feel free to take one of those or five or ten of them and fill them out, and you may just return those with your regular uh, giving here this morning. This is a tradition that goes way back many generations, and it's just a way for, for all of us to be able to bless our pastors with a financial gift during this Christmas season. And the envelopes will be available uh, next week as well. So if you didn't get one this morning or, or you plan to, to wait until next week, that's fine as well. With all the surprises that we've had this year and the unexpected uh, turn of events, our pastors have really had to, to step it up and fighting against the enemy who has, has come against us and with his evil schemes here. And our pastors, whether they work with the adults, the children, or the youth, they have had new and creative ways to just uh, sustain the continuity of ministry. So this is our way to, to show our love and support. And on behalf of the board, I just would invite you all to participate in this. And thank you for, for joining with us. At this time, I'd like to transition to receiving our morning's tithe and offering <clears throat> and missions giving. We thank you for your continued faithfulness and generosity in supporting BFA. Uh, you may deposit your contributions in the white boxes at the back of the church, <clears throat> or also go online. We have our uh, app, our text to give, or you can simply mail in any contributions to the church office. Or you can choose to use multiples of those as often as you would like. There really is no limit. And let's go to the Lord and ask him for his blessing on our offering this morning. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We just thank you so much that 
you are a good God. We thank you for the many giving hearts here that we have in this church and for providing the means for us to continue ministry, Lord. We ask for your blessing on this morning's tithe and offering and missions giving. May it be multiplied and fill the storehouses, Lord. We also ask that you bless our pastors and their families for the countless hours and efforts of ministry that they have done to serve this church, Lord. We ask that you be with us this morning, open our hearts and our minds to receive the word, Lord, and, and that your anointing would be upon Pastor James as he brings a powerful message this morning, Lord. We just thank you and we lift up all of these things to you in your son's name, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You're welcome to stand as we sing one more song to worship our king, or you can remain seated, whatever you prefer.
facing a challenge today where there seems to be darkness surrounding you. But let me remind you of the God that you serve, that he is the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He is the light unto your path. Show us your ways, Lord Jesus. Show us your ways. Oh, that is who you Maybe you have a struggle this morning. Maybe you know somebody that has a struggle this morning. Let's just claim victory in the name of Jesus over that situation. Oh, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. And you are way maker. Keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. That is who you are, Lord. You're the way maker. Way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Thank you, God. Do we have your word to stand on? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That is who you are. We bless you. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, Lord. We pray, God, as Pastor brings the word this morning, that it would penetrate our hearts deeply, Lord Jesus, to cause us, Lord God, to serve you better, Lord Jesus, and to know you greater, Lord. We thank you, Father. We bless your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. God bless you. Don't you think we're living in revelations right now? People want a, an answer to that question. But we've become a country that thrives on the economy but doesn't care about human life. Of course, the impact is being felt in different ways for many people. Normal life canceled. We're going to see a, a battle. We're going to see a divide in the world between governments. Some type of nuclear 9-11 could take place. Uh, the moral meltdown we have in our country that's taking place, the crushing debt. It will be the worst thing ever to happen in human history. America is in spiritual moral crisis. The Middle East is unhinged with uprisings, revolutions, and where is this, where is this heading? We're going to conclude our series on a rude awakening this morning. Jesus said we must always be ready 
because he will come back again at a time when we do not expect it. And so we need to be prepared. We need to be ready. We've been talking about that the last few weeks. So how do we prepare? How do we make ready? You know, when I was in high school, uh, I was able to kind of cruise through pretty much with straight A's. And I didn't have to study much. My parents would ask me, you know, aren't you, don't you have a test tomorrow? Yeah. Aren't you going to study? Nah, I'm good. And so kind of cruised through high school and, and mostly got straight A's. And then I went into college and I took an upper, upper division course. And I took my first test in college. And you want to talk rude awakening, I was not prepared whatsoever for the big jump in difficulty of that test. I got a D, a D. It was like I hadn't gotten a D since I was like in third grade when I had real summeritis or something going on, but I was freaking out. And so I'll tell you what, when the next test came, I was ready. I was studied up. I was prayed up. I had everything ready to go. And eventually was able to finish that class with an A. I had to dig my way out of that. But I was not prepared for that level of challenge. I want to ask if we are prepared for the level of challenge I believe we're going to face in the coming days and months and years ahead. Jesus is coming soon. But there are certain things that must happen first. And a lot of challenges, calamities. One of them is a pestilence. I think we know what that is. A worldwide pestilence that we're dealing with right now. And so we need to make sure we are ready to meet the Lord. And there are certain things that are listed in our passage here in 1 Peter that tell us to prepare. 1 Peter 1, 13, therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy... So be holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. And so we started a checklist. I don't, anybody love doing checklists besides me? Anybody that's kind of nuts out there? Yes. I'm one of those type that if I have a checklist and I do something that's not on the checklist, I add it to the checklist just so I can check it off. And it just feels good. You know, if I'm doing something, i got to get something out of it, you know, some, some enjoyment, and there's just nothing better than to hit that checkbox or scratch through it or whatever it may be. Well, we've got 10 steps here. We've got a checklist. What a perfect checklist, 10 points. I mean, that's just everything around this is great. So let's go over the, the first few points we studied before before we finish up today. Number one, prepare your minds. Peter said, prepare your minds for action. You know, this preparation is first and foremost a mental preparation. The battle is always in our minds first. The greatest challenges we face are between our ears. It's how we process information, how we think about things. Some bad thinking habits that we've developed in our lives that actually lead us down a wrong path. The second part of our checklist is be self-controlled. The Greek word for self-control literally means sober. So to be ready for what is ahead, we need to be sober Physically, spiritually, mentally. Number three on our checklist, set your hope on grace. Don't put your hope in mankind. Don't put your hope in government. Don't put your hope in anyone else or money or any of those things because those can change at any moment. But God is faithful. He's always there. And so we put our hope in the grace of God because no matter what we're going through or what is happening, we have to hold on to hope. And this hope will not disappoint us. Number four... Get ready for the revelation. You see, Christmas is all about the first revelation of Jesus Christ. When God became a man, a baby born in a manger, this was the first revelation of Jesus Christ. And a lot of people missed it. They didn't see the significance of it. But there's going to be a second revelation, and that's when Jesus comes back as a conquering king. And it says the whole world will behold him. Another part of our checklist is be childlike, not childish. I mean, oh, childlike is precious, childish stinks. It's no fun, Henri. So God commands us to be childlike in our faith, but not childish in our behavior. Number six, do not conform. We are not to conform to the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And then we, last week we did number seven and number eight, be holy and do holy. You have to be holy before you can do holy things first. 
You see, holiness is a state of being before it becomes an act of doing. And holiness is that separation from all that is sinful and a consecration to God. It is a detachment from the world system and the world's ideals and to belong exclusively to God. God doesn't share us with anybody else. We, we belong to him exclusively, and that's what holiness means, to belong to God and no other gods, no other idols. And now we finish our checklist on being ready for Christ's return. Number nine, live like strangers here on this earth. Peter said, since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here. Now what does that mean? What does it mean to live our lives like strangers here? When I was working in the oil industry... I went to, as most of you know, you've heard a lot of my North Dakota stories. Well, you're going to get one more. And so I was shipped off to North Dakota while Jolene and our two youngest kids stayed here in Bakersfield. They were still in high school. And there was a severe housing shortage in North Dakota. Oil was $100 a barrel. Boy, it's not there today, but it was then. And so things were crazy. You, trying to find a place to live Men would live in these mobile homes, multiple men in one mobile home, and their walls were just bed sheets that were hang, hung from the ceiling. That's all the privacy they had. Some of them were living in man camps where it was so bitter cold. I'd drive by these man camps, and there's a camp trailer or a truck with just a, 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 a camper on the back of it. It was just impossible almost to find housing. And before I went there, I was trying to find a place to live, and I was about to pay $800 a month for a guy's bedroom. I would have to, uh, the only thing I would have was the bedroom, and then I'd have to share the bathroom and the kitchen with a total stranger. Fortunately, my company came through for me, and they got me a studio apartment for $1,800 a month. It was so expensive to find anything there, but I was so grateful to my company that I didn't have to live in some dude's bedroom. But even when I moved into this, this studio apartment, it was no bigger than a hotel room. I didn't hang up any pictures. I didn't get cable TV. I didn't do anything that would look like I was going to be there permanently. I had signed a one-year contract, and I was committed to coming home after that one-year contract. And so I, I made sure that I, I lived in a temporary way. I wanted no attachments or commitments to tie me there, because I knew it was temporary, and I was going home soon. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't hang any pictures on our wall. Don't take it literally. That's not what it means to, to be waiting and, and for the Lord. But it's about that we shouldn't be tied down by anything in this world. We should always have a sense that everything in life is only temporary. We must learn to hold things loosely. Now, there's nothing wrong with Christmas and receiving gifts. Bless God, I'm praying Jolene hears from the Lord and gives me the best gifts possible. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that. Let me know that we possess our possessions, but we can't let our possessions possess us. We have to, we have to live with this sense that we're, this is temporary here. This is not our home. We are just passing through. Hebrews 11 is called the Hall of Faith, like the Hall of Fame or the heroes of the faith, and it lists how these different men and women throughout biblical history had faith in what miracles God did because they believed. But then it also mentions people who had faith and didn't receive the miracle, and yet they kept believing. Because faith is not getting what you want. Faith is believing, especially when you don't get what you want. And so let's look at these heroes of the faith and how they lived in a temporary way, how they lived as aliens and strangers there. Look at Hebrews eleven thirteen. 13. This is how they lived in this world. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted they were aliens and strangers on earth. So while they were on earth, they actually didn't get to see the fulfillment of the promise. They saw it as a dis at a distance, but didn't get to witness it there themselves. But they were okay with that because they were aliens and strangers here. This was not their home. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had 
an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. We are aliens and strangers here. We don't belong. And I, I know when I was in North Dakota, they could tell I didn't belong. And sometimes I, I didn't want to say where I was from, because sometimes it's not good to say where you're from when you're from California. You know what I'm saying? I remember one time we were moving to the Northwest, and we were talking on a CB radio, and they heard we were moving from California, and they, they yelled at us, told us to go back home. So I, I knew to be careful, and I went into this one customer one time, and I, I asked her, so she wanted to know where I was from, and I said, well, before I answer that, uh, what, what do you, you know, people from what state do you like the least? What have you had the worst problems with? Because I'm thinking she's going to say California, and I'm going to lose this customer for sure. And she said, Iowa and Idaho. Don't know why, don't, don't ask me why, but at least it wasn't California, and I was able to squeak through. But even there, I, I stood out like a sore thumb. Because, number one, just, you know, I had 19 coats on, for one thing. You know, Californians, we don't do good when it's 20 below. But we're aliens and strangers on this earth. It should, people should see in our lives, we should see in our own lives that this is temporary. All this stuff, everything we own, everything we have, everything that's going on, it's all just temporary. And so we should live with a sense it's, it's okay to have the gifts that God has given us, but we hold them loosely. And we're willing to relinquish them whenever he says. We are longing for a better country, a heavenly one. How many of you know the blessings of heaven never fade away? We can lose our blessings here on this earth. We can lose our financial security. We can lose our possessions. But we cannot lose any reward in heaven. Jesus said that's where we should be focused on because rust and moth cannot dest destroy those treasures in heaven. As Larry Norman saying, we are only visiting this planet. Heaven is our true home. And Jesus said that he has gone to prepare a place for us. But how we live here determines how we're going to live there. And so important for us as we walk through this life. See, if, if things don't, if we don't get possessed by our possessions, and if we don't take things here permanently like there's nothing beyond this life, then we will actually enjoy life better here on earth. Knowing there's a heaven makes it easier to live here, to go through the problems and the challenges here, knowing this is not all there is. Can you imagine if this is all there is, 70, 80 years of life, and then you cease to exist? That would be miserable. But we know that heaven is forever. It's eternity with God, with rewards that never fade away. And so we, gotta, we have to live in this world, but we have to also understand that we're just passing through. We're temporary residents. My daughter and her husband and two grandsons are in the air at this moment, flying back home. I can't wait. We're going to pick them up at the airport tonight. But they've been living in another country for three years. And our youngest grandson had to get a special visa that was only good for seven days because he, he had no point of entry. They kept saying, what was his point of entry? Well, he came into the country in his mama's tummy, so I don't know how else to describe the point of entry into the country. But they did. They got this seven-day visa so he could get out of the country. But we were there, and they were there, and, and though our grandsons have uh, a greater uh, benefits by being born there, they are not citizens there. They're citizens here. In the same way, we need to realize wherever we live on this earth is temporary. We are just visitors. Heaven is our home. So we've got to remember on our checklist, live like aliens and strangers here. We're not going to be here forever. It's temporary. And our last checkpoint, number 10, we're also to live in reverent fear. Now the Bible speaks prolifically on the fear of the Lord in both the Old and the New Testament. It's not just an Old Testament thing. It's a New Testament thing as well. Now, we understand the love of the Lord, but sometimes we're a little perplexed to fear the Lord. All through the Bible says we are to fear the Lord. Now, we know we are to love the Lord, but sometimes it's, it's hard to understand this, what it really means 
to fear the Lord. And so I want to define it for you today, hopefully to give you a deeper understanding, because we are to fear the Lord. We are always to fear the Lord. And we are to grow in depth of the fear of the Lord the, more, the longer we know Him. And so here's a definition in Eerdmans Dictionary of the Bible. To fear God, then, is to be completely devoted to His will and its rewards while knowing the awesome consequences of not fearing Him. Wow, that's awesome. Let's break that down. So, for one, the fear of the Lord is to be completely devoted to God's will. That you want God's will for your life. You know, I was praying this week and I was, I just, it just came to me in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're, we are to be praying that God's will will be done in our lives. When we come to Christ, when we give our lives to Him, our lives no longer belong to us. It's not our will, it's what God wants. And there may be things God wants in your life that we don't. But we surrendered our will. When we came to the cross. And so it should be our daily prayer. God today let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants to bring his will to the world through you and me. And so we need to pray God we want to follow your will. That's the fear of the Lord. To be devoted to his will. Not your will or anyone else's. But to be devoted to what God wants in our lives. So that's for one the fear of the Lord. It also is to, we acknowledge the rewards of fearing the Lord. This is what's so awesome about God. When he commands us to do something and we do it, there's often a blessing attached to it. There's a, there's a reason that he sets his commands and there's often a blessing for obedience to those commands. So the fear of the Lord also recognizes the awesome consequences of not fearing the Lord. Listen. We can't get to heaven without a healthy fear of God. And I think it may be something that's lost in these days. There's not a real sense of, of the fear of the Lord. And I think that we need to recapture that, especially in these days. Here's another definition of the fear of the Lord, according to Easton's Bible Dictionary. It is a fear conjoined with love and hope. And is therefore not a slavish dread, but rather filial reverence. If you don't know what filial means, neither did I. So I had to look it up in the dictionary, so don't feel bad. Filial means familial or family or the relationship between a child and a parent. And so the fear of the Lord is always joined with love and hope. We fear the Lord, but it's with the sense of hope and, and love of the Lord. And it is not a mindless, cowering dread. We can have the wrong ideas, the fear of the Lord, that, that we run hiding from God and that we live in this perpetual fear that he's going to whack us on the head the minute we get out of line. Some of us live with an unhealthy fear of the Lord, an unbiblical fear of the Lord. And that is, that is a danger as much as not having a fear of the Lord at all. And so we need to understand that there is a relational reverence. The fear of the Lord is a relational reverence for the awesome power and purity of our, perfectly, our perfect Heavenly Father who loves us as His children. And so the fear of the Lord, He is our Heavenly Father. And we can, the Bible says we can approach Him we can approach the throne of grace with confidence. We can come into God's presence anytime. Even though he's kind of busy running the world and the universe, we can come into his presence anytime because he is our father. But at the same time, we recognize his awesome power. Man, our heavenly father can rock the universe. I mean, it, at the, you read through the Psalms, at the sound of his voice, the mountains tremble. This is, this is our father. This is the God we serve. This is the relationship we have with the Lord. There is love, but there is respect and reverence. So that's the fear of the Lord. Hope, hopefully that defines it a little more for you. It sure helped me. So what's the, so what's the fear of the Lord mean, but how do, we, how do we learn it? How do we learn to fear the Lord? We've kind of defined it, but what I love about the Bible, it doesn't just tell us to do something. 
It tells us how to do something. If God asks us to do something, he also shows us how to do it. And he has done that with the fear of the Lord. I love God's word. I'm telling you, you got you to gotta stay in God's word because it is the guidebook of life. Whatever challenge you are facing, God's word has an answer for it. And so if we want to fear the Lord, if we want to know how to fear the Lord, here it is. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden, hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So let's break that down. If you want to understand the fear of the Lord, you want to have the fear of the Lord in your life, then we need to store up the commands of God in our hearts. We need to know God's word. We need to know what God expects of us and asks of, of us. And so that's the beginning of learning the fear of the Lord is to store up his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, the Bible says. And so we should also turn our ear toward wisdom. What's amazing, it's kind of a circular thing that if we, if we want to ha be wise, we need the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so the more we fear the Lord, the more wisdom we will have. And the more wisdom we will have, the more fear of the Lord we will have. We need to apply our hearts to understanding. You know, we need to take time to study God's word. We are so blessed in the United States of America that you can go online and there are so many study helps to help study the Bible. There are p countries where they only have one page of the Bible or, or one book of the Bible. We have all these tools. We should use it. We should study God's word. We should look at Bible dictionaries. We should look at concordances. It's not enough just to read it. We need to study it. We need to meditate on it. We need to get it into our hearts. We must apply ourselves. You're not going to grow in your Christian walk by doing nothing. We have a responsibility. The Bible says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And so we have to apply ourselves. We've got to make the time, make the effort. And I'm not trying to beat you over the head. I'm just telling you, this is the answer. I remember a, a guy in our church who found him, he was reading through the man. He bought a new boat, bless God. And he was reading through the manual, and he was going over every detail of this new boat. And he sensed the Lord say to him, I wish you would do that with my manual. And he was just struck how much he read through this boat manual and how little he read through God's manual. And so it changed him. He made an effort. I'm going to apply myself to God's word. I'm going to study because I'm going to learn and I'm going to get it into my heart. We need to call out to the Lord to ask for insight. Some things are spiritually revealed, spiritually discerned. And so we need to ask God, God, what does this mean? Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will teach us. And we must look for wisdom like hidden treasure. We must search the fear of the Lord like silver. And then we will understand the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. So this is how we learn and live out the fear of the Lord. And as I mentioned earlier, if you desire to fear the Lord and to to deepen your understanding of what that means. There are benefits to that. There is a reward. And here it is. The fear of the Lord drives out all other fears. I want to, I want to, if you've ever battled with fear, if you've ever struggled with worry or anxiety, I'm telling you one of the cures, the answers for that is to grow deeper in the fear of the Lord. Because if you have the fear of the Lord, it drives out all those worldly fears. And I'm going to show you where it says that in the scriptures. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, 
but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than many sparrows. God knows when a bird dies. And God cares. And yet God cares so much more for you. If God is that attentive to a bird, think about how attentive he is to us. But the key is who we fear. Whom do we fear? We are not to fear man. Jesus says, don't fear man. All they can do is kill you. And we're like, yeah, right on. That's why I'm afraid. I don't want to die. Well, none of us want to die. But I'm here to tell you that if we have a fear of the Lord, we will not fear death. We can overcome every fear that we struggle with. If we're struggling with a a fear of, of losing our finances or or a, a fear of what's going to happen tomorrow, or whatever fear it is, if you have the fear of the Lord, it'll drive out all those other fears, because no one can harm you in the sense of taking away your soul. They can take away your life. They can kill your body, but they can't kill your soul. And so instead of fearing, you know, a difficult boss or a, an unfriendly person or, or fearing what someone else is going to think, Let's fear God. Because God has the power to send us to heaven or to hell. That's who we should fear. And yet God wants, God is not willing that any should perish. He wants everyone to be saved. We are not to fear man. Instead, we are to fear the Lord. When I was probably five or six years old, we went camping in Sweetwater Creek, Sweetwater Canyon in Nevada. We would go to these campsites where, you know, it's, there's, no, there's not even a, a toilet or anything around. It's just rough camping. But it was all for fishing sake. My mom loved to fish, and she would always get her limit at Sweetwater Creek. And so we had gone there, and we were in a camper. And I remember it distinctly because during the day, I was chasing my brother, and I jumped over a rock and landed in a patch of stinging nettle. I had shorts on. Yeah, anybody ever... If, uh, touch stinging nettle in your life yeah no fun and so I remember this camping trip and we were sleeping in the camper the truck camper that night and I was awakened by a thunderstorm lightning rain and I started freaking out I was a kid normally you know at this age I'd, I'd still freak out but not as bad and so I woke my dad because I was afraid and and I was afraid that we'd get struck by lightning and I'll be fried in the camping truck my dad said, don't worry. The rubber tires on the truck will protect us. They'll, they'll act as a ground and you don't have to be afraid. And you know what? Once I heard that, I went back to sleep. You know why? Because I trusted the word of my father. He knew best. He knew more than I did. He cared for me. He cared for his family. And so... All I needed was for my dad to say, it's all right, it's going to be okay. You don't have to be afraid. Do you trust the word of your father, your heavenly father, when he says, fear not, for I am with you? Do you know how many times in the Bible he says, fear not? I don't know either, but it's a bunch. Fear not. Do not be afraid. When the angel came to Mary, do not be afraid. When the angels came to the shepherds, do not be afraid. This is God's plea to us, his children. You don't have to be afraid. You know, we don't have to fear what's happening in this world. We don't have to fear what is going to happen before Jesus comes. We should not live in that fear. And I'm here this morning to tell you that there are times I struggle with fear as well. I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching with you. And you know, I can't wait till I overcome fear before I preach the truth. Even if I can't practice it, I'm going to preach it because it's the truth. But I'm, I'm here to tell you, I understand the, the fear of a loss of finances. I've been out of work before and one time for four months, and I knew that fear and that struggle. I know the fear of, of, your, of wanting to take care of your children, especially once they become adults. 
man, I thought once they became adults, I didn't have to worry about them no more. Oh, man, it just starts getting worse. And then the grandkids come, and now you... So what is your fear? I want you to know that you can conquer that fear by the fear of the Lord. You see, our worldly fear is a bad habit we got to break. When we begin to worry and fret and have anxiety, I'm here to tell you that you, you don't have to fear COVID even if it kills you. And you're like, no, oh, great. Come on. You're going home, man. And remember, you're just traveling through here. You get your flight on. I can't tell you how excited I was when I finally got to fly home for the last time from North Dakota. Oh, man, I was so excited. I had to clean the apartment. And one of the things that was required, they had to shampoo the rugs. And so the guy that I called the shampoo dude, because it had to be professionally done. I couldn't do it myself. And he was like, you know, it's 10 below. I don't know if I can make it today. I said, oh, you're going to make it today. If I have to come get you and carry you like a baby, you will get here because I'm flying home tomorrow and nothing's going to stop me from flying home. I was so fired up and so excited. I was so excited when I got off that plane and kissed Jolene right on the mouth. Bless God. It was awesome. I'm telling you what. I'm excited to go home to be with Jesus whenever that is. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. And the more we fear the Lord, the less we fear anything and anyone else. Fear is the enemy of your soul. Fear will cause you to make wrong decisions. Fear will cause you to not know what to do. It'll paralyze you at times. And so we've got to overcome this fear with the fear of the Lord. We need to revere the Lord. We need to search out his commands, just as I share with you. Proverbs chapter 2, please put it into practice. If you're battling fear, open it up to Proverbs chapter 2 and begin reading those things, those, those steps of overcoming and, and gaining the fear of the Lord. To fear things less, we must fear God more. If we worship him in reverence and awe, all fears will fade. To be ready for his return, we have to overcome our fears. Our fears are holding us back. And you know what's tragic? Most of our fears don't live up to reality. They don't really play out like we feared they would. Some do, but most don't. And yet we spend all that time, all that energy, all that anxiety on something that probably won't even happen. And it's, again, it begins and ends with the mind. What we allow here, what we process here, what we think on here, and that's why we need to renew our mind. I want to pray for you today. If there's anyone here this morning that has never given their life to Christ, if there's anyone watching online, maybe you've battled fear. I want you to know there's a, there's a fear that'll set all your other fears running, and it's the Lord. But we have to come before Him we have to give him our lives. We have to entrust him with all of our lives. So would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me today? If there's anyone here in the church or anyone online you want to give your heart to Jesus Christ, would you just slip up your hand? Anyone in this place? Yes. Anyone else? Maybe you've drifted from the Lord and you're ready to come home. You've been living in a foreign land. You've been living in a land where you don't belong now you want to come home. It's okay. God's always waiting for the prodigal to come home. Anyone else want to give your life to Christ? Want to rededicate your life to Christ? Church, would you join with me for those that have raised their hand and pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you were born in a manger. I believe you died on the cross for me. Please forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and life and make me a new person. And teach me how to fear the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, there's a party in heaven. The angels rejoice every time someone gives their life to Christ or comes home. 
I want to pray one more prayer before we dismiss today. Once again, we'd ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and yet you've battled fear recently, maybe you're struggling with the circumstances you're in, or maybe it's just a fear and you don't understand where it's come from. We know that it comes from the evil one because God's fear doesn't create anxiety, it brings peace. So I'm, I've battled some fears. I'll tell you, 2020 has brought new fears into my life I never had before. So I raise my hand, but if you want me to pray for you just as a group, I'm not calling anybody out. As an act of faith, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm battling fear. Yes. Anyone online as well, you can put your hands down. I want to pray for you, and I'm going to pray with passion because I understand. Lord Jesus, I raised my hand and others raised their hands with me. Lord, we know the truth of your word. And we know that the fear holds us back. It paralyzes. It grips our chests, Lord. And we have that panic, God. And we're afraid that things will go wrong and we'll, we'll lose everything. Lord, I, I just pray in the name of Jesus against the spirit of fear. You said you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And so we refuse to give in to this fear, God. I pray that you would help us to fear you and you alone. Lord, that we would have a reverence for you that drives out all other fears. And so for each person that raised their hand in faith, God, we're reaching out to you. And we're asking for your help. God, we know what your word says. Help us put it into practice. You say, fear not, for I am with you. Lord, we know that's true mentally, but help us live it out spiritually, God. So Father, I just pray we know fear is the enemy, and you have not given us that spirit of fear, so we resist it in the name of Jesus, and we stand in awe of who you are, God. We revere only you. We worship only you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace free to go or stay and just worship for a time or come to the altar but you're free to go at this time